Hallelujah. Keep that praise going. Keep that applause going. We have a great and mighty king. We don't have to whip up enthusiasm. I'd like to think you're enthusiastic. Uh, I'm passionate, enthusiastic, and I want to do all that God has called me to do. I want to move in the spirit because I can do nothing by myself. I can know about the power of the resurrection, but without the spirit, I'm quite lame. And I need the spirit to operate within me. And I believe it needs to operate in each one of us. I believe God wants to refresh and pour out his spirit upon us today. And I like to say that at the beginning because, you know, I can sometimes get distracted, but there's no football yesterday, so I can't get that wrong. But the power of the Holy Spirit, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. We're going to start just talking about and working through Acts. And uh, we're not going to cover all 28 chapters because that's almost half a year. Um, And I'm only doing half a chapter, so it's not a study of Acts verse by verse, chapter by chapter, but key things that happened in the life of the early church. And of course, I could have picked chapter 2 and talking about when the Holy Spirit came and was on the new church, but I just I feel in the premise to that, in the build-up to that, I just need, God just laid something on my heart about Acts 1 to 11. And I might even get on there to mention how they were casting lots to replace Judas. But it, the key thing is that the Gospel of Acts is written by Luke. It's a continuation of the book of Luke. It's put in our Bible in two separate accounts. It's put in, but he wrote it together. And, uh, you know, somebody was joking um, some time ago about the scrolls were 35 feet long and he wrote the book of, Ac- uh, book of Luke, but he had to use a different scroll to write Acts. So they weren't together. They were two different books and they were put separately. But, you know, it just carries on with Luke writing this story about the story and the life of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Then he goes on to talk about the life of Jesus and the resurrection and the power of the Spirit. And, you know, we call this book the Apost- Book of the Apostles. And I know this is not going to be news to you guys, but there's a lot of story about what this book should really be called because Luke didn't put a heading on it. And it's called the Books of the Acts of the Apostles. But, you know, I believe that it is the acts of people, but it's the acts of the power of the Holy Spirit that's driving them that born the early church. The Holy Spirit is key to everything that we do. The Holy Spirit is key to all that we do in our lives this morning. To how we respond to things, to how we act to things, to how we pray for people. You know, there's, there's um, uh, lots of good people before Jesus came and, and, and preached good messages. You know, the Buddha was 500 years before Jesus. He said, don't do to others what you want to have to do to yourself. Resist evil, live a good life. Right? And, and Confucius was before that. Same thing, live a good life, resist evil. Don't do to others what you want to have to do to you. But it's a difference in the power of Jesus because Jesus here, through the power of, and of the gospel and into Acts, we know he's resurrected. We start in Luke 1, 11. He's, it's his 40-day departure. He's been with the disciples for 40 days. Forty days after the resurrection, the tomb empty, the power of his resurrection for you and me, and we've got that gift of the cross and the forgiveness of sins and the power of the grave and raising from the tomb, and they're all great things. But there is still the power of the Spirit to come, to energize us, like a Duracell battery, to plug us in to the things of the kingdom of God, that we might have the power to go and preach the good news to all the ends of the earth. You know, Montgomery... Um, I wrote to, this is a paraphrase, so forgive me. James uh, Montgomery voice says, "The Acts in Acts, it's unlikely if you read it that faith would spread. Humanly speaking, Christianity had nothing going for it: no money, no proven leader, no technology for furthering the gospel, extreme obstacles to overcome. Romans were against it, spoke truths about uh, against the culture of the time, and it was subject to the most intense hatred." and persecution, yet this faith spread across the world. How did it do that? Not just by preaching the resurrection. They needed power. They needed empowering. And this is what this book of Acts is all about. Let me just read the first 11 chapters and see. Let me pull some things out of that for you about what we need to do, what God wants to do with us today. Many of us are baptized in the Holy Spirit, but many of us, I believe, today God's saying we need a refreshing We need to re-energize. We need to plug back into the system. We need to rekindle the fire that's within us. Not that we're not believing, but I believe God wants to rekindle the spirit within us that we can do things for the kingdom of God, the things that we're afraid of, the fear that comes over our lives. God is saying the power is the key to us doing the things of the kingdom of God, to see his kingdom spread in this community. He hasn't given us the world. 
We might have mission things out in India and Ghana and places like that, but it's given us this community to help encourage them the things of the kingdom of God, that they might know life. They might know the power of Jesus Christ. They might know the love of Jesus Christ. And they might know his Holy Spirit power to take them through difficult times. I think it's a remarkable, remarkable story. In my former book, and I'm going to say all these names wrong, but I'm leading the church, so uh, I'm, I'm preaching the, the message. So, Theopolis, who's he? Anybody know? Lover of God is what it says, you're correct. There's many schools of who they think he might be, but his name certainly means lover of God. Was he a Roman official who Luke was writing to? So many think that he was a lover of God and that the Romans, he wrote, a, he wrote an account in Acts for the defense of Paul when he gets to Rome, that the Romans know about the Acts of Paul and that these are, this is the defense paper in Acts about who Jesus is and what, what the life of Jesus was all about. All right, but it's never mentioned again as far as I'm aware. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Do you know, I've not seen that before. That Jesus Christ is resurrected from the grave, is being taken up to heaven, is in a different body, is in a spiritual form, although he had the shape of a body, and yet he still instructs the disciples, gives them instruction through the Holy Spirit. He was still passing on instructions through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think he was leading in here to make sure they understood that the Holy Spirit was coming and the importance of the Holy Spirit. And as important as his death on the cross was, the forgiveness of sins, and the importance of his resurrection from the grave, the Holy Spirit was key. The Holy Spirit was key. And he still gave instructions to the apostles he had chosen through the power of the Holy Spirit. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. There's that waiting we talked about last week. This waiting period none of us like. You know, but this waiting period isn't a wasted time. This is waiting for God to turn up and move us in power. And remember, waiting, if I was a waiter in a restaurant, I wouldn't be waiting sat down, I'd be waiting on tables. So to wait for God, he wants us to keep on serving, waiting on him, doing the things that God wants us to do, be in the place that God wants us to be, but he wants us to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this morning, God wants to break through into our lives for the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. And he gave him this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized you with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What a promise that's going to be for them. You know, we baptize people, we immerse people, they're drenched in the water, they come up absolutely drenched. But he's saying here, baptism's important, but it's not the end. You need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You need to recognize and feel and to know the Holy Spirit this morning. They gathered around him and asked, Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Well, I've heard a lot of people preach and say, what a stupid question. But it's not a stupid question because they know the scriptures. And he said it earlier. But you know, he said to me, it's not for you to know the time or the place. The time that the Father sets. Can you imagine if he said, you know, it's going to be over 2,000 years before you see that. They could have given in. Don't know about you. I'm a sustainer. And I'm a perseverer, but if somebody says it's 2,000 years, you're not even going to see it in your lifetime. Oh, heck, what do I want to do about that? But the thing is, the glory of God is with us constantly, and we're building their shape. Sometimes we, we, in this world, we can look around and not see the kingdom of God in the way that God wants us to see, simply because the world and culture is just trying to cover it up. But the kingdom of God is on the move. The kingdom of God is building. The kingdom of God is growing. You know, and it starts with you and me. It starts with growing with you and me and then an encounter that we have on a street corner that we can't manufacture, that you can't can't bring out, just happen because of the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit in what God is wanting to do in our lives and to build that 
kingdom, to build the kingdom of God. It's not about building a kingdom of Shearer Forest Community Church. It's about bringing people into the presence of God that they might know his love and his grace and his mercy through the power of the Holy Spirit that they would have that revelation of who he is. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky and he was, do- he, was, he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him going to heaven. They were encouraging, saying, this, this, this guy's going to come back in exactly the same way you've seen him go. I don't, I don't know how you'd feel if, if we were stood with Jesus and suddenly started to levitate. I mean, we've got someone in the room that tells me how that works in a, in a conjuring magic circle. But, you know, can you imagine Jesus just suddenly sort of going, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm lifting up. I think I'd be starting to freak out a little bit. I, I think I'd be quite worried about what was taking place. But they're reassuring the disciples here, saying, don't worry. As you've seen him go, he will come back. If you've seen him go, he will come back in that vein. So he's coming back. And I want to make sure that we've done everything we can to prepare a place, to prepare a kingdom for when he comes back to be with us in this place. You know, I don't know about you. I always say this, but you guys are obviously better than me. But I can find it frustrating, can't we, sometimes, to try and live a good life, to live a life for God, to be the person God wants us to be. But sometimes it's like being on a ride at Alton Towers. It's a bit of a white-knuckle ride. It gets a bit scary in the the things that God's asking us to do. And, you know, this is why the Spirit's so important. It's why the Spirit in our life... I mean, if we're believers in Christ, the Spirit's within you. You're a child of God, it's within you. This is talking about pouring the spirit, the baptism of the spirit in you to strengthen you and to empower you and and, and to go on and do the things that God has called you to do. God here is saying, I'm not going to tell you to do this and then stand at a distance and just watch. He said, I'm sending my Holy Spirit to be within you. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to be encouraging you and strengthening you and being the power within you this morning. You see, the church and the early church wasn't born out of the resurrection. It was born out of the power of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection is important to our faith, but if it had stopped there, we wouldn't have had much to preach about. The Holy Spirit is the one that comes into us and drives us and, and encourages us to be out there to preach the good news. So the church was, grew through the power of the Holy Spirit when they received the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. To grow the message of God, his love and salvation throughout the world. I think God's given us quite a small patch here. You know, Lidworth, Rainworth, Ravenshead, you know, edge of Mansfield. It's quite a small patch. But, you know, the fact that the 12 men, and obviously they had to replace Judas, they cast lots in those times. That's in, chapter, that's in verse 23 to 26. They cast lots. That's what they did. Then now we know that we, we test things in, in, in bringing Daniel in. We didn't cast lots. We sought the Spirit and we prayed over a long pre- length of time. The spirits came together because God's brought that together. But it wasn't by rolling lots on the floor. I'm not knocking them for what they did. But that's what they did at the time. And I'm not sure if they got it all right. As you know, I believe that Paul should have been the 12th apostle. But who knows? It was all about God's timing. But that's what they did because God wanted a team of 12 to build the kingdom of God and go into this world. And they changed the world forever. Changed the world forever. And you know, this risen saviour wasn't an illusion. It wasn't a delusion. You know, if you go back to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, it talks about he, he appeared in front of 500 people. It says in that, in that uh, letter, he appeared in front of 500 people. And some of them are still living. So there were still witnesses around to testify to the fact that they'd seen the risen saviour. You know, I don't think really it's debatable whether Jesus rose from the grave. But the resurrection is key to the birth of the early church. It's key to the power. It's key to building. It's key to strength. Don't get me wrong, if you believe in Jesus Christ this morning, you've not sensed the Holy Spirit, you're saved. Right? You've got an eternity. The the resurrection shows us the eternity with God. But he wants us to serve him, to build for him here on earth, and to just get the maximum benefit of the blessing while we're here on earth. Right? It's not about getting into a better seat or a better bungalow or a better mansion. It's about serving God where we are 
We have, I spoke before that wherever we stand, these feet are our temple. We're the temple of God wherever we stand. It's no longer a building. The temple is where we stand, and he wants us to carry the Holy Spirit. You know, um, we used to talk about plugging in our mobile phones. I don't know about you, but I never plug in my mobile phone anymore. So I have a plate on my bedside cabinet, and I just drop it close to it, and it charges it. And it just, again, talked to me about the closeness of God, our relationship with God, which is quite close. And the closer we get to God, the more of that power and charging we can get. We don't have to plug in physically. I know the plate, the, so the analogy is flawed a bit because that plate's plugged in somewhere. But what I mean is I just put my phone down and it charges up. And that says about our relationship and God wants to be closer to him, built up in him, be close to him, receive his Holy Spirit, continue to be refreshed. So wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. For you receive power. And it's talking here about being witnesses. Witnesses to his church in this place at this time. To be a witness to the ends of the earth. To be a witness in our life. To explain what we know to believe through our experiences, through the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Not something we've read in a book. We don't need more information. The disciples didn't need more information. They needed the power of God. They needed the power of God. They knew Jesus. They lived with him for three years. They'd seen the miracles. They believed who he was, but they needed the power of the Holy Spirit in order to take on the mantle, to pick up the baton. It talks about power in the scripture. And many of you know that the word power is dunamis. It's where we get dynamite. Uh, from, and that's where we get the stem of the word dynamite, and the power is explosive. Right? The power that God wants you and I to have is explosive. It has the benefit and the principle of changing our lives and the way we conduct our lives to move by the power of his spirit. That we might shine the light in darkness. We might be in difficult places. We might be in difficult times in our life, but the Holy Spirit can be with us to bring peace in difficult times. Walk us through it so we can see the light. You know, when I, when I became a Christian, um, someone was talking about uh, David Cameron over the last couple of days, about when he first got into office and they went to the cabinet meeting. He, he just did this at the cabinet table. Well, that was my life before I met Jesus. I never looked up. I was constantly thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I've got a good life, but what am I going to do? There's something not quite right about this. I didn't even know what I was talking to. But somebody encouraged me to look up, to lift my head. And then I looked Jesus right in the eye. And I knew, because I'd get eye contact with Jesus, that he loved me. That Jesus knew me. Jesus loved me. And I could trust him with my life. I want you to know this morning that wherever you are in your journey, I want you to know you need to look up, make eye contact, because Jesus loves you, he wants to walk with you and to know you, and he wants to fill you with his power because he wants us to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. God's on a mission. <laughs> that brings it down to human level. Don't worry about it, Paul. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> It's either you or Gordon dropping to sleep, but I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a close at some point. God was on a mission. God was on a mission to build his church. Jesus came, came for three years in his ministry. I know he's around 33, but it was the three years of his ministry. But he built up 12 men. And when Judas gave up his right, you know, People often ask me about Judas. And I think if Judas had repented, he'd have been back in the flock. You know, I generally believe that, but he wasn't meant to. But just to give you a counter to that, Peter, right, messed up. He denied Jesus, but he allowed Jesus to reinstate him. There's always a possibility of reinstating if we've walked away from God, if we believe that we've done something so terrible that we think God can't. Forgive us. I want you to know that he restored Peter. Why? Because Peter wanted to be restored. Peter wanted to be reinstated. Peter wanted it so badly. Judas just gave up his right and went to be where he is today. Didn't even take his 30 pieces of silver with him, did he? You know, his cash prize for powering out. Being powered by the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, 49, as it gets towards the end of Luke, 
Luke mentions the same promise in a slightly different way, but he says, I'm going to send you, this is Jesus, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Just a slightly different description, but wait in the city until you've been clothed with the power on high. You know, I think for some of us this morning, that wait is over. I think God wants to touch you with the power of his spirit. God wants to encourage you and strengthen you uh, spiritually in your body. Uh, and he wants you to, he, he just knows your desire, but he also sees your apprehension. And he wants to wash that apprehension away through filling you with the Holy Spirit. See, in, in, in Acts 1, 4, he gave him a command, didn't he? He gave him a command. On this occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift that the Father has promised. I believe some of us this morning, I believe that spirit, God wants to refresh us. God wants to pour out his spirit upon our life. God wants us to start to build the kingdom of God, to, to move out in the power of the Holy Spirit, not because then we can go, oh, aren't we great? He wants us to move in the presence of the Holy Spirit because the presence of the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, but it humbles me. It doesn't make me have a sense of power in the sense of my own doing. You know, and uh, it's strange in this world, but if I was to say to you, I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, you go, ooh. But I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I don't like it when some parts of my old life surface. I know God shows me sometimes things I need to change and work on. That's every single one of us. But I want to serve God. I want to know his spirit. And I want to walk with him. And I want to be constantly empowered by his spirit to do the work that he's called us to do to take the gospel, to be his witnesses, to know his power, know his strength, to be encouraged by what Jesus did for you and me. That command, the power is sending, can be yours this morning. If you've never known it, it can be yours this morning. If you've known it and you feel that you're in a parched land, a dry place, a difficult place, you can be refreshed. You can be poured out with your spirit. You can know the autumn rains. You can know the presence of God. Because sometimes, you know, I often see people I meet and, and they're really tired. They're not talking about a spiritual sense, but they're really tired. You know, they're really stressed out. But they don't see it for themselves. I know when I was working at Ashbury, there were times when I was so stressed out with the pressure of the job. You know, I often used to say, I love pressure because pressure motivates me, pressure gets me on. I'm one of these that if I've got three weeks to do something, I'll still do it in the final week. It's like bringing three substitutes on when I'm 2 nil down. And I bring on the uh, different set of forward lines and we attack the goal and we try and pull it back. But that's, that's just me. But at times I need the Holy Spirit to come and strengthen me, to build me, to encourage me to give me revelation, to give me that boost of power. Daniel's car packed in a couple of weeks ago and we needed to charge his car up. We needed to find a battery from somewhere. We needed to buy a battery charger. But we plugged that battery charger in a portable charging machine. We put it on the terminal. It wasn't fired into life. And I feel some of us just need that charge and that kick from God this morning. It's not a criticism of what you're doing, not a criticism of where you've been. It's, I think, John's just wanting to take us to a new level. He just wants to empower us to a new level in the things of the kingdom of God. I mean, I haven't read verse 14, but again it goes on. They all joined together constantly in prayer. So when they were staying in that room, when they went to be the place where Jesus told them to stay, they were praying. And it says, along with uh, the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. We're in this together. We're not alone. In the kingdom of God, you're never alone. In the kingdom of God, you're always part of a fellowship with God and with other believers in Christ Jesus who believe in the same thing. We're going to sing Spirit of the Living God to close. But I want you to stand. And we'll turn the microphone off. We won't be on camera. But if you want prayer for the Holy Spirit. Just even let me know or come forward and we'll pray for the Holy Spirit, the refreshing, the power of God to fill you, strengthen you, and lift you at this time. In Jesus' name, amen.